My name is Paul Vallone. You are listening to 106.7, Wilmington's Big Talker. I'd like to welcome you to Guns, Politics, and Freedom, where each Sunday at 5 p.m. and now Saturday at 1 p.m., we give you the ammunition to better defend your gun rights. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop. Check them out at HyattGuns.com. In case you aren't familiar with me, I direct Grassroots North Carolina, or GRNC, since 1994, our state's most effective gun rights organization. As its director, I was involved in drafting and passing our original concealed handgun law. Since then, GRNC has gone on to engineer passage of concealed handgun reciprocity, our purchase permit bypass, castle doctrine and stand your ground, the expansion of concealed carry into state and municipal parks, restaurants, public assemblies, educational properties, and much more. Grassroots North Carolina is exactly what the name implies, a grassroots collection of volunteers from all walks of life who share a common concern that our constitutionally guaranteed freedoms are being eroded. Check us out at grnc.org. That's grnc.org. Welcome to Insurrection in America, Legal Self-Defense. That's the topic of today's discussion. We will discuss what you can do to legally protect yourself, your family, and your business during this or the inevitable future riots breaking out across our country. To discuss the issue, we will have internationally renowned self-defense attorney and defense law lecturer and teacher, Andrew Branca, whose uh, site can be found at lawofselfdefense.com. Next week, we will have a renowned expert in armed self-defense discuss the practicalities of how you can defend yourself against angry mobs. I would love to tell you that America has been the victim of more than a week of mindless violence. Yes, you heard me right. I would love to tell you that you have been the victims of mindless violence. And why would I love to tell you that? Because the truth is, what we are seeing is widespread violence without a doubt, But much of it has been anything but mindless. Much of it has, in fact, been carefully coordinated and planned using tactics designated to inflict the maximum possible destruction and mayhem. And in our last segment today, we will discuss who might be coordinating that mayhem and why. One of the differences about the destruction breaking out across America, difference from previous riots, even widespread riots, is that police are being told to stand down. I once debated a leftist who opined, and I quote, Why do you need guns? We have the police to protect us. Yeah, even his own side laughed at him. But now, government doesn't even bother with a pretense of doing anything about widespread violence. In Minneapolis, the head of the police union said, and I quote, Our chief requested 400 more officers and was flatly denied. This is what led to the record-breaking riot. Or take, for example, this gem from the police chief of the city in North Carolina with the highest per capita rate of Obama stickers in the state. Police Chief Cassandra Deck Brown of Raleigh. And I quote, I will not put our police in harm's way to protect property inside a building. Yep. Raleigh Police Chief Cassandra Deck Brown held a press conference on the Sunday morning after the mass violence and looting by leftist protesters, and Deck Brown then reportedly lectured us on white supremacy in front of looted buildings, which, if videos are any representation, were not looted by white supremacists. Incidentally, if Deck Brown... Chief Deck Brown thought her statement or even her kneeling down with protesters against ostensible police brutality would placate the rioters, she was wrong. At a later meeting with rioters, they demanded her resignation and further demanded that police refrain from using tear gas on rioters, saying of police actions in Raleigh, and I quote, kneeling with protesters doesn't even start to excuse it. It's pathetic. These officers must be held accountable. Those who stood by should be ashamed. A good cop would not have complied with those orders. A good cop would have quit. In other words, they want to hold officers accountable for trying to keep order. Got it. But never fear. The man who wants to be the leader of the free world has the answer. 
yes sir, would-be President Joe Biden, recently explained to us dullards how police should be trained. And I quote, instead of standing there and teaching a cop when there's an unarmed person coming at him with a knife or something, an unarmed person with a knife, okay, uh, shoot him in the leg instead of in the heart. Well, there you have it. Now, I do think we need to clarify what an unarmed person with a knife is, since knife attacks probably kill more people every year than guns, but, or perhaps that in the throes of a dead, deadly struggle, shoot him in the leg is this stuff of bad movies. But what I want you to consider for a moment is the combination of profound ignorance and the blissful confidence with which he tells people trained in armed conflict how to do their jobs. If old shoot him in the leg Joe gets elected, perhaps we can look forward to instructions to our military to defeat their opponents by shooting him in the gun hand. You know, you can see the contrast between the left and the right in how they protest. Excuse me for a moment while I wax nostalgic about the good old days of the pandemic, such as they were. Uh, like everyone else in America these days, we were and still are divided on whether or not to reopen the country. And like everything, uh, everyone thing else in America these days, the division was among what we will call for the time being political lines. Now, with the right, as always, favoring letting people make their own choice on how they should deal with COVID-19, and the left, as always, playing safety Nazi by demanding that the economy remain closed, for our own good, of course, and people's livelihoods be damned. So what did conservatives do when faced with Governor Cooper, Cooper's safety autocracy? They demonstrated, of course. They used the good old American form of protest. And much to the consternation of the Raleigh News and Observer, the newspaper I call Pravda, official organ of the Communist Party, the demonstrators brought guns. Now, mind you, it is against North Carolina law to bring guns to a demonstration, and they were clever about calling it in the undemonstration by claiming they were just taking a stroll, never mind that they announced it on Facebook, of course. And by the way, the UNC School of Government just ran an excellent and very balanced analysis of the legality of guns at protests, and for that matter, the open carry of firearms in general, including uh, when the ancient common law charge of going armed to the terror of the people may or may not apply. In general, the UNC School of Government has done excellent analyses of gun-related legal issues, analyses which are unbiased and accurate as opposed to, say, the crap coming from Attorney General Josh Stein. But I digress. These conservative protesters brought not quite legal guns, and frankly, I didn't support their means of protest. But you know what? They didn't hurt anybody. They didn't lob any bricks at police, and they most certainly didn't loot any stores or burn any police cars. By contrast, the side that claims to promote tolerance and civility, when they have a grievance, burns down our cities, loots the stores of the innocent, and of course, tries to kill the cops, which, as opposed to protecting yourself with firearms, they previously told you should be the sole source of your protection. A tiny sample of headlines, and I quote, Man shot dead amid violent George Floyd protests in Minneapolis. Five shot during protests over death of Minneapolis man, one fatality. Or this gem, and I quote, Rioters set fire to home with child inside, then block firefighters access. Ah, but what goes around comes around. Some of the leftists have gotten little surprises. Early on in the debacle, Atlanta rioters, as you probably heard, attacked CNN, smashing windows and defacing the CNN sign. Ah, uh, but it gets better. Political junkies among you are probably aware of the little leftist rag hailing from Durham called Indie Week. Little, if anything, is too left-wing for Indie Week. So when demonstrations came to Durham, Indie Week was all for it, lauding them as extremely peaceful until moments later when their tune changed, 
Lee Toss, Raleigh news editor for Indie Week, tweeted and posted pictures of destruction, saying, I'm devastated. We're a progressive newspaper. Last night I was inside when the first brick was thrown. Thrown, that is, through the window of Indie Week. It seems that the left just discovered the monster they have created, although I wouldn't count on them realizing it. I left a comment which said, on one of their articles, that is, which said, So now your editor has discovered progressives are not immune from leftist violence. Perhaps you should check undercover videos from Project Veritas where they recorded members of Bernie Sanders' campaign staff saying that if leftists gain power, liberals go to the wall first. You're listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom. Right now, we will take a short break, after which we will return with renowned self-defense attorney Andrew Brockhoff. listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom today on Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. Our show is sponsored by Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop. Today we have the good fortune to have as our guest Andrew F. Branca, who is in his third decade of practicing law, specializing in self-defense law in the United States, where he is an internationally recognized expert. Andrew has contributed uh, in this context to, to the Wall Street Journal, National Review, the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, and many others, including nationally syndicated broadcast media. Andrew is also a host of the Outdoor Channel's TV show, The Best Defense, and contributor to the National Review Online. He is a guest instructor uh, and subject matter expert on self-defense law at the Federal Bureau of Investigations National Academy at Quantico and the Sig Sauer Academy, an NRA Life Benefactor member, an NRA Certified Instructor, an IDPA Charter Life member, and a Master Class Competitor in multiple IDPA divisions. Andrew teaches lawyers how to argue self-defense cases as a certified instructor with a continuing legal education system in numerous states around the country. He recently won a UC Berkeley Law School debate on Stand Your Ground and spoke at the NRA annual meeting on self-defense law. Andrew's blogs on self-defense cases and his legal service can be found at lawofselfdefense.com. Again, that's lawofselfdefense.com. Welcome, Andrew. I'm very pleased to be here, Paul. Thanks for having me again. Oh, the pleasure is ours. So, this has been quite a week. Breaking out all over the country have been what could only be described as widespread insurrection. What I'd like to talk about is not the political Im implications of that insurrection, although plenty could be said about that, but rather about how citizens can legally protect themselves when faced with violent rioters. Because two questions commonly asked by gun control advocates have clearly been answered. The first they, want, they ask is, why have a gun when the police... We have the police to protect us. And yes, I know the police have no legal obligation to protect you. The second question they always ask is, why would anyone need an AR-15? Which, of course, is wrong for any number of reasons, but uh, some of which I discussed in the first segment of the show. But as opposed to normal riots, we are seeing something very different right now. Namely, police are being told to stand down. I will speculate on reasons for that in my last segment, but the implications are that when rioters are looting and burning buildings, some of which have been occupied, police are nowhere to be found. Worse, Antifa has promised to attack not only city centers, but also suburbs. As we will discuss, uh, we'll discuss a couple of examples in a moment. But first off, um, why don't we start by giving our listeners the you know, one-minute capsule summary, if such can be possibly done, on what is actually required before they can use deadly force in self-defense. Go ahead. Sure. Well, the, the standard rule is you can use deadly force in self-defense when you're an innocent party facing an imminent threat of deadly harm yourself. And in some states, if you don't have an avenue of safe retreat that you can take to avoid the need to use deadly defensive force. And frankly, that same generalized self-defense policy is what applies in a riot situation as well. 
uh, for all practical purposes. What makes riot situations complicated is not so much that the law changes, but that the circumstances are different than, a, say, a one-on-one -on -one, uh, confrontation when you're being attacked by an individual criminal. Okay. And normally, of course, one cannot use legally use deadly force in defense of property. But with looters breaking into your store while armed, okay, uh, and perhaps while you're armed, I would think the uh, lines between destruction of property and a deadly threat are somewhat blurred. What's your impression about that? They can be blurred from, as a factual matter, but the legal justification for the actual use of deadly defensive force must be the defense of human life. Uh, there is one state, Texas, that does have a provision for the use of deadly force in defense of mere personal property. Uh, even in Texas, I urge people not to rely on that statute. It exists. It applies. Uh, but there are a lot of loopholes that have to be, uh, I'm sorry, a lot of hoops that have to be jumped through. There's a lot of criteria that are extremely subjective, and there's no guarantee that a prosecutor or a judge or a jury will see that subjective view in the same way that you do. So I always urge people, even in Texas, uh, to make sure that if they're going to be prepared to use deadly defensive force, it's in defense of innocent life, not in defense of property. And I sympathize with the store owners who are really being economically destroyed. Anyone who thinks their damages are covered by insurance simply doesn't know how that works. They're, they're done if their store is looted, uh, if they're any kind of small business at all. I'm completely sympathetic, but the law does not allow you to shoot people over property damage or economic loss. Okay, and, and we're gonna, I'm going to actually come up with a couple of scenarios, things that I've seen videos of that are running around on the Internet right now, uh, actual circumstances, and I'd love to know your opinion on some of these. So uh, you mentioned this earlier. What do you think the best way to avoid all of this, you know, to, to deal with these riots would be? The simple, most effective advice is? Don't be there. Be someplace else. The best way to win a gunfight or a knife fight or any kind of fight or avoid getting into a fight in a riot situation is to simply be someplace else. That's the, that's the simple best defensive option we have, assuming, of course, that we actually have that as an option. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that in, if we have that as an option. Um, of course, first, Antifa has actually threatened to spread this to the suburbs, meaning that uh, none of us might potentially be safe at some point uh, down the road. I mean, this is obviously, as I've said earlier, a very organized national effort. Um, but uh, let, let me say, what do you think about the uh, the shop owners who remain in their businesses, you know, during one of these, uh, these riots and uh, with the idea that perhaps a looter might try to break in? Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I think they're placing themselves at a lot of risk, and I understand why they're doing it. They're seeing perhaps a business they've invested their entire life in. They've borrowed every penny they could from friends and family. If it's gone, there's nothing left. Anybody would want to protect that, that kind of investment of time, energy, blood uh, into their enterprise. Um, and they are allowed to use force in defense of property. It just can't be deadly force. The trouble is, of course, if you're facing a mob of people, the mob – it's almost baked into the cake that they are a deadly force threat simply because of the disparity of numbers involved. And now you're in a situation where it can be ambiguous whether your use of defensive force was really necessary in defense of your life or whether you were using that deadly force in defense of property. And a prosecutor can see that it's ambiguous and decide, well, let's just arrest this guy, charge him, bring him to trial, and see what a jury thinks about it. And if they decide to do that, uh, you're looking at perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal expenses. So even if you win the legal battle, you're financially wiped out anyway. Okay. And I guess that, ring, that brings up a very interesting question, as you say, the disparity of force by a mob. I mean, it's very easy to say that if, uh, you know, a looter comes at me with a tire iron, a tire iron, excuse me, uh, then I clearly face a deadly threat, and I should be justified in using deadly force. Now, my next question is, though, what happens to the uh, 50 people behind him? Um, what happens if you use deadly force and perhaps it spills over onto others in that crowd? Uh, how might a court see that, do you think? Well, if the whole group is working cooperatively to attack you, they're each responsible for the worst acts of their worst member. Uh, so everyone, it's just like if two people were holding your arms and a third person was trying to stab you. They're all guilty of 
trying to kill you, uh, even though only one of them had the knife. The difficulty, of course, is that the 50 people behind the guy with the tire iron are going to say, well, we weren't cooperating with him to hurt anybody. We might have been cooperating with him to steal property, uh, but you're not allowed to use deadly defensive force against us for that. If people want to walk into your store and just grab stuff off the shelves and walk out with it, they don't have to personally threaten you necessarily to do that. Uh, certainly not every single one of them. And the ones who aren't are not, in fact, a personal individualized threat to you against which deadly force would be appropriate. So, it's a terrible situation. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's just a terrible situation. The, the store owners are effectively left in a circumstance in which there's really there's they they can easily find themselves in a situation where there's nothing they can do to protect their property, and anything they do do that involves deadly force is simply a, a ticket to prison. Um, yeah, uh, you're right. I, I can see how it would the circumstances would be very very ambiguous. Now, one thing we have here in North Carolina, and uh, and I'm probably going to curtail this segment in just a moment, but uh, one thing we have here in North Carolina is, and I know you hate these words and you don't prefer not to use these words. We have a, a castle doctrine law, a castle doctrine law which basically creates a rebuttable legal presumption that if somebody forcibly and unlawfully enters your home, your motor vehicle, or your place of work, that you face a deadly threat and uh, if a, a reasonable fear of imminent death or, or serious bodily harm, which of course is the trigger for potentially using deadly force. When we come back from our break, I would like to talk about how that impacts the ability to use deadly force if somebody is breaking into forcibly and unlawfully entering your place of work. Right now, folks, you are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. We will be back after a short break. My name is Paul Vallone. You are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker 106.7, WilmingtonBigTalker.com. Our show is sponsored by Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop. Check them out at HyattGuns.com. We are speaking with internationally renowned self-defense expert Andrew Branca on the topic of using self-defense, what you may you legally do or not do uh, when faced with the type of uh, insurrection which is occurring across the United States. Uh, because it presents a very complicated uh, set of circumstances for self-defense, uh, because, of course, clearly you cannot use uh, deadly force to defend against property crimes, but at one point, of course, does it uh, become a deadly threat instead of simply a pop property crime. Uh, welcome back, Andrew. And I guess uh, the first thing I'd like to talk about that we mentioned before the break is North Carolina has a castle doctrine law, uh, and I know you prefer not to use those words, but basically it creates a rebuttable legal presumption that if somebody forcibly and unlawfully enters your home, your motor vehicle, or your workplace, that you face a, seria, a, a reasonable threat of imminent death or great bodily harm. So tell me, how does that uh, that law impact the uh, the riots that are occurring in uh, in North Carolina, particularly with regard to somebody breaking into a business where the business owner may be inside. So it certainly makes the um, the the legal position of the defender of force much more robust. So what the law is doing in those cases is it's differentiating between the use of force in defense of mere personal property, items, goods on a shelf, and the use of defensive force in defense of highly defensible property, which always includes your home, and then it varies by state. Some states include a place of business, some states include your occupied vehicle. And as you say, in the context of that highly defensible property, it creates a legal presumption that if you're defending against an intruder who's forcibly and unlawfully entering that highly defensible property, there's a legal presumption that you had a reasonable fear of eminent deadly force harm. That gives you three of the five elements you need for a claim of self-defense, a justification for use of deadly defensive force. And, of course, under the what's actually the Castle Doctrine, you're relieved of a duty to retreat if you're in highly defensible property. That's the fourth of five elements to justify your use of force. The only element left for the prosecution to attack is that you can't have been the aggressor in the fight. But if someone's breaking into your highly defensible property, you not being the aggressor is kind of baked into the cake. So from a strictly legal perspective, it makes it extremely difficult uh, to achieve a conviction against 
someone who qualifies for that legal presumption, someone dealing with a looter forcibly, unlawfully breaching uh, a home, a store, an occupied vehicle. The difficulty is that the prosecutor can still compel you to make that defense at a trial. You'll almost certainly win, but you'll win at what for most people is a catastrophic financial cost, and there's no guarantee you'll win. Uh, we tell every client, if we put you in front of a jury, there's a 10% chance you're getting convicted. I don't care how innocent you actually are, because that's just the noise in the system. So the, the legal risks are never zero, no matter how strong your position. And these laws do give you a very strong legal position. And then, of course, there's always the risk of, in fact, losing the physical fight, which is the worst possible outcome. Uh, at this point, I'll put in a quick plug for Grassroots North Carolina because uh, thank you for saying that it makes your position much more robust, legally speaking, to defend yourself if somebody breaks into your occupied shop because Grassroots North Carolina was the main mover behind that Castle Doctrine and Stand Your Ground bill back in 2011. So I'm happy to say that that is the, uh, the law that continues to, uh, to keep giving, although as I noted and as you mentioned, uh, it is a rebuttable legal presumption. So it is, if it were to be abused, then the prosecution could argue that uh, that, that presumption does not apply in this case, correct? That is correct. They would need some rather unusual evidence to rebut the presumption, but it is possible. I mean, if you drive around in a car that says, you know, with a bumper sticker that says looters will be shot, uh, then the prosecutor is going to you know, introduce that bumper sticker into evidence and argue to the jury that, in fact, you had a state of mind that you were prepared to use deadly force strictly in defense of property against looting, because technically looting is simply a property offense, uh, and not genuinely in defense of yourself. Uh, good point, because you see a lot of those kind of bumper stickers, uh, and I agree with you. I don't put bumper stickers of any kind on my car. Anyway, um three possible scenarios here. One, a tanker truck found itself in the middle of a riot and the truck driver was dragged from the vehicle. Now, in there are two cases where this has happened. One, uh, he shouldn't have been there. Okay, got that. Okay, but what uh, what are the implications for that driver being truck, you know, driven for, excuse me, pulled from the truck if he were to have a firearm and use it in, in self-defense? Well, if you're being pulled from a vehicle by a mob, that's a deadly force attack. You should presume you're going to be maimed or killed as a result of being removed from your vehicle. Uh, certainly, if I had a firearm and I, people were breaching my vehicle, breaking the glass, opening the doors, attempting to drag me out, I would use that gun to defend myself. Here's the difficulty. Um, a single person with a gun, and typically it'll be a handgun, of course, against a mob of potentially hundreds of people, is not going to be a fight that goes very well. I don't see what the alternative is. You can't simply allow yourself to be killed. You have to do what you can to defend yourself. And heaven forbid there's other people in the car you have a duty to protect, children, spouse, parents. Uh, you have to fight, of course. Um, but it's such a poor tactical situation that, frankly, I would do almost anything in my power to avoid getting locked in that position and having to fight from that static position. I would much prefer uh, to use my car as the... Uh, weapon, so to speak, mm -hmm. as the tool of force to force myself out of that locked-in position and, again, compel my attackers to come to me if they're going to be insistent, insistent on attacking me. Excellent points all. Okay, second case, the South Philadelphia gun shop owner was broken into once and waited in the shop after it was closed when three individuals broke in, at least one carrying a gun. He shot and killed one of those people, and uh, I believe at least one of them was arrested later. So uh, your opinions on that? Well, if you're in a, a, a deep blue urban center and you effectively set what appears to be an ambush, uh, the prosecutors, the authorities, absolutely hate that in their eyes you've created the necessity to kill uh, now there's plenty of places in the country where nobody would blink if you live in oklahoma for example and your store has been repeatedly robbed and you decide to sleep on a cot overnight just in case they come back the cops will say hey good work nice but if you live in <laughs> philly or new york or baltimore and they perceive that you've in fact set an ambush which is what it looks like to them for the next time the robbers come back you should fully expect to be prosecuted i'm not Ooh. saying it's right I'm just saying that's what they will do. Yeah, the sad, the sad uh, fact is that uh, we shouldn't say in, the, in terms of the law, it depends. But in this case, I guess it depends on where you are. Good point. Okay, and in another video, we had two owners of a tobacco shop who are shown from outside the shop in a video, one pointing a handgun at a looter, at re several looters, as they leave the shop while loudly ordering them out. And then inside the shop, another is pursuing them out also with a handgun. Uh, your thoughts on that? 
Well, one of the concerns there is to what degree the jurisdiction differentiates between a threat of force and a use of force. So threatening someone with a gun for defensive purposes versus actually shooting them with a gun. Not all jurisdictions do. Massachusetts, for example, says you need the same justification to threaten someone with a gun as you do to shoot them, um, meaning you have to have been facing an imminent deadly force threat and not have been the aggressor yourself. Other jurisdictions are much more ambiguous about it. I mean, they'll say, well, the pointing's okay if, even if you would not have been entitled to shoot, the pointing is okay as long as it's for defensive purposes. But then it becomes a subjective judgment call. Was it for subjective purposes or was it because you're racist? Um, mm. And who's going to make that call? It's not going to be you who's making that call. It's going to be other people, police, prosecutors, judges, ultimately jurors. Uh, and if they decide contrary to what you claim your motivation was, well, off to jail you go, no matter how genuinely good your motivation may have been. Now, let's talk, you know, most of our listeners are here in North Carolina. Now, I realize you don't necessarily practice in, in, in North Carolina. Do you have any thoughts on how that, uh, how North Carolina in general, I realize we have some blue areas in this, you know, as well, uh, Durham, you know, Wake County, the highest rate of per capita Obama stickers and everything else. But do you have any thoughts on how that might apply in North Carolina? Well, it's, North Carolina, as you say, is a very diverse state in terms of politics. You have these blue centers, and then you have widespread red areas. And how that same exact law is going to be applied is going to differ depending on what area you're being charged in. Uh, so it really matters where you are, who the cops are, who the DA is, who the judge is, What's the jury pool going to be? Okay. And so now in about the last oh, 30 or 40 seconds, why don't you tell our listeners what services you provide and how they can go ahead and, uh, and avail themselves of them? Sure. Uh, we uh, provide legal consultation services to people who've been charged with crimes of violence as a consequence of acting in self-defense. Uh, that's about 20% of our day-to-day -day work. Most of our work is actually educating people on what the law of self-defense actually is so they can avoid facing prosecution in the first place. And people can learn all about what we do, much of it for free, at lawofselfdefense.com. Okay, lawofselfdefense.com, and uh, you offer seminars both in line and in online, rather, and in person. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, folks, if you want to know uh, more about the legalities of using deadly force in self-defense, check out lawofselfdefense.com, lawofselfdefense.com. Uh, Andrew Bronco, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's, this has been most educational, and we appreciate it. My pleasure, Paul. Folks, you are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker, 106.7, wilmingtonbigtalker.com. We will be back after a short break for still more information enabling you to better defend your gun rights. My name is Paul Vallone. You are listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom today on Wilmington's Big Talker. Our show is sponsored by Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop. Check them out at HyattGuns.com. Like every other facet of 21st century American life, the responses of collectivists versus individualists in response to the riots were dramatically different. Like thousands of business owners around the country, immigrant Zola Dias, the owner of Adam Concept Store, a clothing store in Atlanta, described how he lost everything after his business was looted and vandalized. I came to the United States to make my dreams come true, he said, and now we just don't know if we're going to reopen. By contrast, however, in Cleveland, the owners of Corbo's Bakery met looters with guns in hand. Beyond being taunted by looters, the bakery owners had to argue with a bystander who videoed the encounter, trying to convince them not to use firearms to defend what he called insured property. But in the end, the shop suffered only a broken window. Said the owners, quote, we weren't going to sit back and let it happen. Or how about South Philadelphia, where Greg Isabella, who owns a gun shop called The Firing Line, saw a group of looters on his surveillance video breaking a padlock on his gate using bolt cutters and descending on his shop at 4 a.m. Tuesday morning. One pointed a gun at him, 
Big mistake. Isabella responded with a Bushmaster M4, shooting one looter in the head and wounding a second looter who was arrested at a hospital while being treated for a shoulder wound. Or the Santa Monica liquor store owner, who armed with an AR-15, deterred looters, demonstrating yet again why anybody needs an AR-15. And then there was the delightful Twitter video of two armed tobacco store owners, one herding out looters from the inside as the other covered the fleeing looters with a handgun commanding, move now. And as riots consumed American cities, at least one community got it right, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. According to the Coeur d'Alene Press, and I quote, Reports and rumors that groups bent on rioting and violence in Coeur d'Alene brought out men and women with guns on Monday, determined to stop them if they arrive. Dan Carson was patrolling Sherman Avenue with a semi-automatic 12-gauge across his chest, an AR-15 strapped to his back, two 9mm handguns holstered, and a 38 Special. Quote, I heard there are some people on the way who shouldn't be here, he said. Those people, he said, were Antifa and Proud Boys, militant far-left and far-right groups. Carson said he was in Spokane Sunday night helping protect businesses there. He said he supports the right to protest and is also upset about the death of George Floyd. By all means, I'm on their side, he said. I disagree with what happened. What I don't agree with is when you turn to violence and you start rioting and destroying businesses and hurting people who have nothing to do with any of it. That's why I'm here, uh, what I'm here to hopefully prevent, he said, adding, I'm not going to be alone. There's a lot more on the way. Well, he was right. Soon, armed men, self-described as a loosely formed group of patriots, arrived. The sidewalks were packed with people walking up and down Sherman Avenue, firearms proudly displayed for all to see. Brett Surplus of Coeur d'Alene, a former police officer, said he was there to defend people's businesses and protect people's right to free speech. He said a show of force by armed citizens may prevent problems. I want to protect our way of life, he said. Unlike the rest of America, in Coeur d'Alene, there was no violence. Without doubt, videos of looters and other rioters demonstrate that at least some of what has transpired has been the result of spontaneous protest and the multi-generational propaganda campaign designed to make identity politics and class resentment the norm across America. But videos and other evidence revealed that much of what occurred was not a spontaneous event, but instead planned by Antifa and other leftist organizations. As shown in Twitter, Twitter videos depicting black-clad Antifa types paying protesters to stir up trouble. And across the country, pallets of bricks began to appear in places where nothing was under construction, including right here in Fayetteville. This, by the way, was reported by the magazine Law Enforcement Today, which had to defend its account against PolitiFact, which tried to label the piece as mostly false. Then there was the video from Manhattan, with rioters tearing into a pallet of bricks while exclaiming, Yo, we got bricks, we got bricks! The questions we should be asking are, who is funding this effort to destabilize America, and what do they plan to accomplish? At a press conference, Attorney General William Barr said, and I quote, three different sets of actors are involved in the demonstrations, namely peaceful protesters, looters, and extremist agitators that hijack protests to pursue various agendas. And Barr cited unidentified foreign actors that might have played a role. Then, of course, President Trump promised to designate Antifa a terrorist organization. But none of this addresses the very serious question of who is financing it, who's behind it. The obvious culprit, of course, is George Soros, who has provided millions to leftist organizations such as MoveOn.org. But I have yet to see anyone track a money trail from Soros to the current debacle. Writing in Breitbart News, radio host Kyle Olson wrote a piece entitled Counter-Terror Expert Says Feds Unaware of Antifa, Black Lives Matter, Communist Connections and Objectives. 
Counterterrorism expert John Guandolo believes the riots that have taken place across the country are a coordinated effort by Marxist and communist groups. He singled out Antifa and Black Lives Matter as communist organizations during an appearance on the Kyle Olson show, which will air on Saturday. There are, and he said, quote, there are citizens who support Black Lives Matter who are in it because they want liberty. They want to make sure things are done right, he said. But the leadership of Black Lives Matter, the entire reason the organization was formed, it was formed as a Marxist communist organization, Guandolo said, uh, who was in the FBI for 13 years and founded Understanding the Threat, said, the activities that it participates in, you've got to look at it through that lens. Guandolo noted, protests appear spontaneous, but they are immediately violent. People are armed. We now know there are pre-staging pallets of bricks, and police officers have been targeted. He said he believes Antifa and Black Lives Matter are seeking to overthrow the U.S. government. Guandolo, a counterterrorism expert, said Freedom Road Socialist Organization is behind what's going on across the country. When you tell someone in the government that Black Lives Matter is a Marxist communist movement as a matter of objective fact, he said, they just don't know this. In terms of motives, I can only I can't help but point out a principle which reads like something straight out of Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals. It is this. To create an authoritarian socialist utopia, you must first tear down the existing society. I would argue that Antifa, Black Lives Matter, and whichever Marxists are supporting them are only doing more quickly what their more presentable cousins, namely so-called progressives, have been doing for generations, namely using disorder to promote central control to the obvious detriment of individualism. Now, I'm accustomed to hearing wacky stuff from leftists, you know, abolish the police, free violent criminals from prison, pay blacks trillions in reparations, etc. But what I am not accustomed to hearing is, is hearing it from people who are supposedly in charge of cities and states. People like Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Frey, New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, Washington, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, and, of course, Raleigh's own Marianne Baldwin. Take, for example, the Minneapolis City Council. Several members of the council this week have expressed support for radical changes uh, to how the city handles law enforcement, including a move to dismantle the police. Jeremiah Ellison, the son of Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, said, quote, We're going to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. And when we're done, we're not simply going to glue it back together. We are going to dramatically rethink how we approach public safety and emergency response. Nor was Ellison alone in this lunacy. His call was echoed by Lisa Bender, the president of the city council. Yes, she said, we're going to dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department and replace it with a transformative new model of public safety. A friend recently told me he was embarrassed to talk about the looting and rioting here with friends from other countries. I replied that he shouldn't be embarrassed. Instead, he should be proud. Proud to live in a country whose freedoms are so despised by collectivists that they will go to any length to destroy them. But he should also be afraid, because never in the history of the United States have we come so close to self-immolation. My name is Paul Vallone. You've been listening to Guns, Politics, and Freedom on Wilmington's Big Talker, where each Sunday at 5 p.m. and now also Saturday at 1 p.m., we give you the ammunition to better defend your right to keep and bear arms. Please check our sponsor, Hyatt Guns, America's largest gun shop at HyattGuns.com. I also encourage you to check my website at GunsPoliticsAndFreedom.com. See you next week.